Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and welcome back to Wall Street Silver. Joining us today is our good friend, Mike McGlone, Senior Commodity Strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Welcome back, Mike. Thanks, Ivan. It's good to be back. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's have, uh, you know, it's always great having you on to talk about the market, everything that's about to develop in the commodity space. I wanted to bring you on to talk about silver and gold, of course, our main topic. What is happening in the markets right now? You know, Powell just had their uh, their meeting not too long ago, and they're uh, it, and they're going to say that they're going to start cutting rate hikes. What do you think silver is going to happen? What's going to think going to happen to silver, and what's going to happen to gold? What's your what's your ideas? Well, the main commodity that remain bullish um, is gold. Um, I'm more concerned about virtually all most other commodities, which are most of them are in downward trajectories. And you look at the Bloomberg Commodity Index, energy, energy sector, industrial metal sectors, copper. There's certainly most notably grains because they have the shortest supply elasticity factor. Silver to me is a little bit more in the middle. I'm worried about I'm bearish on copper and industrial metals and silver is more in that slant but silver's got a nice little um unique space it's just consolidating between this 21 and 26 dollars per ounce level and bias is typically upside from that but you know, who knows um where it's going to go first but the fundamental drivers to me are quite negative on a global macro basis which to me is the base for everything and i can get into that a little bit and then i trickle down from that view so uh, what what do you think about you know the possibilities of people have been talking online lately about you know in the future if there ever were to be a collapse of the u.s dollar and we do go to a digital and it could be 10 20 30 40 years it could be a very long time uh, but if there is a digital currency, would it ever be backed by gold? Because you see Russia and China uh, pushing their you know, new currencies or their BRICS nations and having it backed by commodities. Is it ever a possibility in the future, in the next 20, 30, 40 years, that that could happen? We, ha we would have a go back to a gold-backed uh, standard like before. Well, um, everything's possible. Having um, tokens attract gold um, via blockchain and, and crypto um, cryptology makes complete sense. I mean, there are, some of them are exist. There's crypto dollars. To that's basically just tokens attracted out. The bottom line for gold is that the deepest pockets on the planet, central banks are buying gold. And you have to just expect that to go away. I think it's just accelerating. There's a good reason for that. Um, most We know the two prime suspects are uh, China and um and Russia could say some of those for, former Soviet Union states, um, <laughs> but there, there's a good reason for that. I mean, there's a pretty significant war going on. Um, it was somewhat instigated by one person, Mr. Putin, with support from another person, Mr. Z. Um, and there was $300 billion of Russian assets that were seized. I mean, that's kind of upsetting for yeah. some other people like that. So I can see the rush to gold as wars and it's kind of just accelerating. And that's part of the reason I'm bullish gold. I think gold's just a matter of time. It, you know, it's hovering above this $2,000 an ounce level and might kind of dip below, but I think it's just a matter of time. It gets a catalyst to go to $3,000. Now I'm tilting over to my outlook for gold, going with the hypotheticals of what could happen to me are, well, not going for silver. Central banks aren't buying silver. They're buying gold. Yeah. And all the, all the implications to me are very bullish. So let me give you my macro on that. I think the big difference from this time last year is the sentiment has completely shifted from um, people expected a recession to U.S. Now that they, they don't, they expect a soft landing, which means the risk is we just tilt back a little bit. And you mentioned that early on. The Fed is pushing back a little bit on all these eases that are priced in the market. And that's another thing that's somewhat silly. So I think it's silly right now. The market basically is expecting about 12% increase in earnings this year for the S&P 500. The volatility, the VIX volatility index, if you just take it minus the T-bill rate, Mm -hmm. It's the lowest since 2007. Just look at a 12-week basis. So volatility is always reverting. It's very low. Volatility only goes up from those levels. It can stay low for longer. Um, and the market's priced in right now, as we speak on the 18th, priced for about 160 basis points of easing in the next year, which is just silly. Right. <laughs> it's just, I mean, <laughs> the Fed has said they're not going to do that. But the thing you've got to ask yourself is what's going to take them for to ease that much? And I think it's going to take just a little bit of reversion of the massive pump and risk assets from last year. To me, gold sniffing that out more appropriately. So if you look at 50 week moving averages, gold is at all to new high. If you look at 50 week moving averages on things, just like annual measures on Bitcoin's much lower, stock market's much lower. Yes, they're bumping up near highs, 
But I look at it right now is just look at the iterations of this year is do you really think we're going to be able to take this market and keep it rallying like this? Or what's the risk of just little reversion and mm-hmm. everything the dominoes trickle down? So that's my, my base case this year is that we follow the path of Europe, which is essentially in recession. Certainly, if you look at Germany, mm-hmm. we follow the um, typical historical effects of the most significant rate hike effects in history. And that will be towards a recession in the U.S. Yes, I've been early, but it's just a matter of time. And then China comp- continues to mean revert its massive growth of the last 30, 20, 30 years, it's akin to Japan when it peaked and Soviet Union when it peaked about 30 years ago. And the key question I ask myself is what stops that? Now that is the clear trajectory you're seeing commodities right now. Virtually all commodities have been declining significantly from those peaks from 2020, 2022, and they're still going lower. They're just corn recently reached the three year low. Crude oil keeps getting hammered. Copper's still under pressure. And gold's the only one going up. That's a recessionary trajectory from commodities. And I don't see a lot to stop it. I think the risks are it accelerates by the time um, we get to the end of this year. So I just wanted to let everyone know about our new sponsor, Strategic Wealth Preservation. They are an international precious metals dealer and they are a secured storage provider that have headquarters in the Cayman Islands. The company owns and operates a large class three UL rated vault in the Grand Caymans and they offer other strategic locations as part of its global storage network. The specialize in the acquisition, secure storage, and liquidation of precious metals for individuals, companies, trusts, and wealth management professionals on behalf of their clients. So if you guys want to check them out, the link is in the description below. And uh, let's talk about the U.S., like the petrodollar and gold specifically, even like the U.S. dollar itself, uh, because the U.S. dollar is not backed by, you know, like the gold standard, how it used to be. Do you believe, Mike, that in the event of, let's say, regional, more regional bank collapses in the near future or someone in, is going under uh, and then there's, you know, or the unrealized losses become uh, real losses, the U.S. petrodollar is, you know, the whole world needs, like the U.S. specifically needs people to use the U.S. petrodollar and, and buy oil through the U.S. petrodollar. But what happens when they start losing that control like what happened in the middle east saddam hussein tried to you know switch off the u.s petrodollar and sell his oil in euro and and we've seen what happened gaddafi he tried to sell his oil other than u.s petrodollar so like my question for you mike is what happens when there's a world in the future where the u.s they cannot afford to have let's say russia or china completely switch off the uh you know the u.s petrol uh, yeah, what happens there? Is Would it be just an ultimate world war or what would happen? The Russian ruble, the Chinese yuan, our U.S. dollar wannabes and their neville, they might get close, but they're not even on a scale of one to ten. Virtually every other currency on the planet is like a five compared to the dollar. There's nothing right. even close in terms of fiat currencies. First, I'll look at the interest rate. You get over five percent guaranteed. Good old U.S. government treasury bills. There's nothing even close. Maybe in India has a higher rate, but look at Swissy. That's the only other currency that's really kept up over time. Right. These rates are very low. And then you have this issue of who's providing the security for the Red Sea right now, which is very ironic. One of the most significant shippers coming from China to um, to Europe is China. <laughs> Thank you, U.S., <laughs> for providing security on the open sea. So we still have the, you know, the, the world's most powerful military in the world. And then we're starting to see the the cracks in the um, foundation for Russia and China clearly breaking down. I mean, there's economy. Russia has just proved how horribly um, managed they were as far as an economy and a, and a military. Right. And China is clearly dropping rapidly. The book I'm reading, I just read recently, was The Price of Time, um, pointing out how um, China is just doing a typical mean reversion in emerging market that um, – Japan did. And the key lesson I learned from economists in the last hundred years, if you really want to get moved up histor- um, in terms of economic growth in the world, you cozy up the U.S. If you want to get, co- if you piss off the U.S., good luck. And they have in a, in a way that's supporting war. So this is how bad things are right now for those two emerging markets. They are way overdue for, and it's happening without the U.S. even lifting the pinky. <laughs> the world just yeah, realized, okay, so it was focused on what's happening. And and so they're scrambling for alternatives. The gold is is the first one that's even close. It maybe is close to the dollar has worked and it's got the, you know, the history, but 
any other one currency that's even close. I mean, even you mentioned the Swiss. Sea. It's the only one that's really survived over yeah. time. Russian tanks can come down on heartbeat. As Jamie and Diamond says, it's under the um, umbrella of U.S. US military protection, NATO, and whatever, and military monetarily everywhere. So the U.S. dominance is actually, I think, at an inflection point. It's really just accelerating with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's pullback. I mean, just look at exports, U.S. Um, imports from Mexico now, they are parabolic. They're more well than above um, export, imports from China. And that's whole dynamic is completely shifted. Um, right. And then of course, there's this issue of pissing off your, your best customers, Europe and um, the US. So I look at this right now, by the end of this year, we're gonna see the reason why the CSI 3000 index is one of the worst performing, the Chinese index is the worst performing stock indices. Now lately we're seeing the Chinese government coming and buying ETFs. Well, that makes sense, they have to, but they have to support that market. It's right. that bad. So the property crisis is that bad. The exports are that bad and just simple mean reversion. All the thing, the key thing from an insights group at Bloomberg is I cannot put my name and put China on a research report together because I'm at risk of what happened to my colleague in uh, Shanghai who was detained for a year for writing something the Chinese government oh, that's did not crazy. like. I mean, it's, it's that bad. And anytime there's bad data, it's repressed, it's suppressed. And when China, when Mr. President Xi came to the U.S. in November, I think it was, yeah, his tail was feeding to his legs. I think he sees what's going on. It's as bad and worse than I think the Japanese peak. Now, I have that from inside experience. I work for a Japanese firm, Industrial Bank of Japan, which is now Mizuho. And I remember running around that imperial palace in Japan in the early 90s when the price, the value of the palace was more than the state of Arizona property in total real estate value in China around the 2016 peak was at about that level versus GDP. Wow. And it's just reverting, just getting started. And the difference is there's that connection with unlimited friendship that didn't happen before with an aggressor who started a war in, in Europe. Um, so I look at it as there's nothing even close to the dollar in terms of fiat currencies. If the U.S. just gets a little bit of their fiscal order in place, that would be so helpful. And that might happen in the election. I'm hearing it's becoming very high in the polls that um, U.S. citizens are, are being unhappy with the inflation created by the massive monetary pump in that related. Right. Um, so I look at it as dollar stalwart. The U.S. is stalwart. One thing the Federal Reserve just proved how interlinked global economies are. The Fed just tweaks a little bit. Every other currency in the planet, every other central bank in the world has to tweak to keep up the buck. I mean, the Chinese yuan is pegged to the dollar. The, the, the uh, Hong Kong currency is pegged to the dollar. Why? Because there's nothing better and not even close. And and so I'm, I'm on a bit of a rant, but I do enjoy when people point out some things. Well, you talk about the petrodollar. Let's look at Maybe President, um, I'm sorry, Henry, Henry, Kiss, Henry Kissinger helped get that started, that whole concept of the petrol right. dollar. But right now, the U.S. and Canada together produce um, more, have an excess of liquid fuel and crude oil production of about 6 million barrels a day, which is about equal to that rising OPEC surplus because they can't, oh, really? they have to, they have to cut back their supply to make up for the excess supply coming out of the U.S. So you know why it's happening? Two key reasons. Number one, technology. U.S. and Canada just adopted, adopted the technology. And more recently, as the farmers say, the high price cure. So right. those of us who are early and eventually became right about the price of crude oil going down, I pointed out why. The world has changed. So, for instance, when uh, we talk about OPEC supply cuts, who does that hurt? China and Europe. I mean, yeah, not yeah. so much Europe, but China. And China is the economy that's the most fragile, I think, that's really starting to just do a normal reversion of way overdue for emerging markets. I probably should stall there. There's a lot I can dig into on these subjects, but we've yeah, studied absolutely. the lessons of history, which I've really been doing. I've been kicking in lighting a lot more history lately because it's that kind of time is we're in the back end of a significant liquidity boom and we're busting. And that's what I see why it's going to continue to support gold, silver too, but it's probably going to be bad for copper. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's it's such a great uh, lesson having you come on. You know, it's so informative having you come on, Mike, to Wall Street Silver. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for coming down. Where can people contact you and where can people connect with you? Well, first on a Bloomberg terminal, and I'm on, on Twitter um, at Mike McGlone 11 and LinkedIn, Mike McGlone, Bloomberg Senior Commodity Strategist. And if people want, I'm happy to add them to my distribution list. Just send me a message. And thanks for having me. I, I've been, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's a huge pleasure having you on. And hopefully in the future, as, uh, of course, the market develops, love to have you back, Mike. Looking forward to it.